Hey guys, so I wanted to give you a little bit of an introduction to a process that we're going to use a lot in AP Physics, a process called linearization. All right, we're going to talk about two ways that we go through this process. First is when we have the data and we have a graph and we can then identify what type of function it is and linearize it from there. The other way is when we don't have a graph, when we just have a formula, what needs to happen in order to be able to linearize it based off of the formula that we're given, one that we need to rearrange a little bit. All right, so here, let's start off with this. We've got some data here. It gives us time, so at various different times, a certain distance is measured, right? Pretty straightforward. You can look at this graph, and you look at this graph, and you say, ah, yeah, that looks fairly quadratic, right? Um, I can go in here. This is a, a spreadsheet, which is kind of nice. I'm going to go into the series here, and you'll see over on the right-hand side, I can add in a trend line. And you'll notice right now, if I put in a linear trend line, the data obviously doesn't look linear, right? One of the biggest telltale signs is that in the middle, it's below the graph, and then over on both of the ends, it's above the graph. And that basically means that by curving the line a little bit, it should fit the data a little bit better. And so we're going to go in here and we're going to change it to uh, hopefully be able to do a graph that fits a little bit better. We're going to go with polynomial here. We're going to go with polynomial degree two. And you see that it goes through the points fairly nicely, right? Not perfect, not perfect, but fairly well. This is a point I want to make. I, I'm clicking on the R squared value here because the R squared value tells how close it is to the actual line. All right. Now, obviously, it's got a 0.999 uh, R squared value. Anything close to one is really good. So we've got a pretty good connection here. But I want to make a point in that just because it fits better doesn't make it right. Right. Look, look at this for a second. I can actually change my polynomial degree to a sixth polynomial. So it'll be an X to the sixth function. And what happens when I do that? You'll notice that now the line actually goes through every single point there. However, that doesn't really, uh, yeah, you can see the R squared value is now one. It's now perfect because the line actually goes through every single point. Physics doesn't really work this way, right? Just because the math says that's a better fit doesn't mean it's actually a better fit for our situation. Chances are this is an object that's rolling down an incline or something like that, and it's speeding up as it goes down. Um, that's going to be a fairly consistent increase. It's not going to be kind of a wavy type of function there, right? And so one thing I want you to recognize right away is, yeah, you can make a line that fits the dots better. But just because it fits the dots better doesn't mean it's fixing the data better. So I'm going back. In physics, we like to try to say that the things are, nature is simple. It likes to be straightforward. It's gonna, it's not gonna make a very complex situation if it doesn't need to, right? So what you can see here is, is that it looks fairly quadratic. Now, to confirm that, we're gonna do something called linearization, all right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually add in a new column to the left, all right? Now, we believe that this is linearization which me, uh, we believe it's quadratic, which means that y is equal to x squared, right? Um, it doesn't have an x, it, well, I guess the x-intercept is zero down here. It looks pretty close to zero. It does have a zero, zero in it. So we do kind of believe it goes through the origin. y equals x squared is kind of the parent function there, right? Now, it's probably had some stretches and squishes that makes it look a little different than our normal y equals x squared. We're not going to worry about those exact numbers right now. The important thing is recognizing that it's an x squared and that if I graph y versus x squared instead of y versus x, I should be getting then a linear graph. Here, let me show you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the time and I'm going to square it okay? because time is the x value. And by graphing y versus x squared, I want you to see what happens. So I'm actually just going to take each of these values and square it. Okay. And yes, I want it to autofill. So it's just taking each of my x values and squaring it here. All right. Now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to take that time squared and I want to graph those. All right. 
So we're now going to, we're going to delete this old chart and we're going to insert a new one. Now look at, look at the data now. You see how it's almost a nice, clean, perfect straight line. Again, I can go over here to my uh, chart editor. I can go into the series. Let's see if I can get it to, there we go. There's our series. We're going to add in that trend line and a linear. Look at that. It's got a really nice linear graph there. The fact that when I squared the X values, it linearized my graph means that a quadratic is the correct fit for this data. And it's important to be able to go through this linearization process for several reasons, which we'll see in the next couple of uh, examples. All right. So uh, that's the first example. No notice that all I did was I squared the X values and I squared, I, I graphed Y versus X squared here. All right. Let's look at another example. So this one has distance and force. And you look at the data there and you can see how it's decreasing. Now, uh, just to, to demonstrate this, um, some of you may say, ah, well, maybe that's the left-hand side of a quadratic graph. Well, let's, let's have a look. What happens? Okay, again, I'm gonna take that distance and this time I'm gonna square the distance. Okay, so this is exactly what we did last time. We square that. We're going to fill it in. We're going to get rid of this. And we're going to insert a new graph for those two here. Chart. All right. And there you go. Look at what happens. This is the distance squared. But see how it doesn't linearize my data? It doesn't seem to make it any better or worse. It looks almost the same, all right? This is evidence that my initial data was not quadratic. And I know some of you are sitting there saying, well, yeah, I knew that, Mr. Bywater. I knew it wasn't quadratic. You're just crazy. Okay, well, I can't debate that. However, let's go back to our original data here. We're gonna insert the chart just for those that weren't able to figure it out. Hopefully you look at this and you look at that and you say, well, look at that. It looks kind of inverse. See how as X gets bigger, Y gets smaller. That looks kind of like our mathematical relationship of inverse. So let's try that. Let's try one over distance, okay? And so this is gonna equal one over the distance there. Now, uh, it we put that in. We say, yes, please do. We're gonna get rid of our old graph. We're going to graph the new graph. We'll insert that chart now. And look at that. How does that look? How does that look there? We're gonna to go to customize series. We're gonna put in that linear trend line. What do you think? That look linear to you? It looks better, but does it look linear? Look at the last, think about the last, remember how it was below down in the middle and then it was above on the ends? That was a sign that it wasn't really a linear graph. It was more of a, a curve, all right? Now, if you think back to that original graph that looked like an inverse, remember on the worksheet that I gave you, inverse and inverse squared look very similar. This is the way that we're gonna be able to tell the difference between whether it should be inverse or inverse squared. If we test inverse, which is what we just did, the reciprocal function, the one over X, if we test that and it looks like this, where it still looks like maybe it's a quadratic, then it should be an inverse squared for the quadratic. We can test that. We can do one over X squared and we can graph that for the inverse squared function. And that's what we're gonna do right now. If I were to get a linear graph here, I'd say, yeah, it's inverse. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, okay, well, let's try inverse squared. So I'm going to do that distance squared. So instead of doing one over a squared, I'm going to do uh, a two, I'm going to do one over a two squared. So it's going to take that previous uh, cell and it's going to do one over that cell squared. All right. Again, we're going to copy this down. There we go. It changed all those numbers. And look at this. Look at how nice and clean that linear graph is now. It's a little bit above, a little bit below. Deal with it. 
Okay. When we gather real data, it's not going to be perfect. It's not going to go through all the points. That's what we talked about in the previous video. The previous section of this video is that going through all the points is not necessary. Modeling the data and trying to understand what those data points are trying to tell us. Now that's important. And so at this point, we now understand the relationship between distance and force for whatever the scenario is here is inverse squared. That if I do one over X squared, right, that I end up getting a graph that gives me a straight line. And notice that the data here is one over X squared. I know it didn't change my label for me. That's not a big deal. But the idea is that we got a linear graph here. All right. I'm going to show you one more example. One, I, I told you there were two different ways that we would use this. So come on with me to the next one and uh, we'll, we'll look at one more example. All right. So this is our last example. You'll see this is a little bit different. We don't actually have an equation here. We have a couple of variables that we're able to measure, right? Due to whatever the experiment is, we're able to measure the acceleration, probably using some type of accelerometer right? Your phone has an accelerometer in it. It can measure acceleration. So some type of accelerometer. And then we can also measure the radius, right? The, the radius of the circle that the object is going in. Uh, it's moving in a constant velocity. So it's, it's some type of object that can go at a constant velocity. And we're just restricting the radius and finding out how that then affects the acceleration, right? And so therefore, these are the two variables that we got. We've got R and A, and we want to be able to put those together uh, as a relationship. I, I think that uh, it's probably easiest if we look at R as the independent variable and A as the dependent. But the question here is, how do we need to write this? this it, that we have an equation, right? And this is, this is more likely what you'll see from AP you're likely to see something where you can create an equation. Probably not this simple, but this is a good way to start. You can write an equation, and then you have to figure out how to make that equation linear. All right? So what I want us to look at here is we've got A equals V squared over R. We want to think about how this can be written so that it's linear. The most common linear equation here that we know of is y equals mx plus b. You're all comfortable with slope-intercept form, right? So we've got y equals mx plus b. So how can I write this so that it matches that y equals mx plus b? Well, you can see that a is already over here where the y is. So we could make y equal to a. Now, there's obviously nothing being added on at the end. And so we can make our y-intercept zero. This won't always be the case, but in this situation it is. So what that means is that this v squared over r needs to be mx. Now r is the other variable we have. So r needs to be in the place of the x. So I can rewrite this as v squared times 1 over r. Right? That's the same thing as v squared over r. And so I've taken the r term and I've put that in the place of the x. And so you'll notice here that x can be 1 over r. m is v squared. Now, what that means is I can now create a graph. Right, I can create a graph in which the x-axis is going to be 1 over r. The y-axis is going to be a. And that should give me a linear equation. In fact, I'll show you right now. So we said we were going to make y be a, and x was going to be 1 over r. So very similar to in my previous slides, we're going to make this 1 over r. Okay, so we're going to equals 1 over this number right here. So essentially, we're saying that it's an inverse relationship. We'll go ahead and fill it in. And we're going to now create a graph. We did this, remember, through the process that we looked at with that equation. How do we write it as a linear equation? What needs to be in the spot of the y? What needs to be in the spot of the m? 
and what needs to be in the spot of the X, all right? And we put this up, we'll go insert, chart. Come on, baby, we don't want that. We want a scatter plot, and we only want the one over R and the A. There we go, now it's graphing one over R and A. And you can see this now, if I go over to the customize like I did before, we can go into series and we can say, give me a trend line, give me a linear trend line, check that out. It has now given me an, a very nice straight line that fits the data pretty well. Some are above, some are below. It's fairly evenly spaced out and it actually looks pretty good. Ah, there we go, there's our equation. And you can see that it gives us an equation. It does give us a y-intercept, but that's pretty dang close to zero, okay? You'll notice that there's a value here in front of the x. And if we go back to our screen from before, before, so what we just got is that we got that a is equal to 4.98x and then plus that 0 0.0345. So that was essentially the zero that we had said that B was. It's, it's close enough. Sometimes we can force that to be zero, but uh, we won't worry about that too much right now. And we've got the A equals 4.98X. Now remember that the A, sorry, the, the number in front of the X here, that's the slope, right? That's Y equals MX, where Y was A, m was v squared and x was 1 over r. And so the v squared is 4.98. So we can actually solve for what the constant velocity here is. We can say, well, the slope is equal to v squared. And so because the slope is 4.98, we can square root both sides and we get 2.24. So we did a couple of things here, right? We used the equation that allowed us to find the, the variables that we needed to put in for X and Y, right? It helped us to determine that we needed that one over R for X and Y was just A. It also allowed us to solve for everything else, which ended up being the slope, that was the V squared, which then allowed us to find the velocity that the, art, the, the object was moving at the whole time. Okay, so by measuring these other things, it allowed us to find that constant velocity. So there's various ways that this can be used, and we'll see that as the year goes on. But this is a very, very common AP type question where we have to use the physics that we know, this equation or set of equations that we know, in order then to find some missing variables. But we can only do it if we're able to make the graph be a linear graph with a constant slope. All right, so hopefully you'll get a little bit of practice with that later. And I will see you in class.